so this is our third lesson video for chapter 7. It's our last one for chapter 7. And so we're going to continue talking a little bit about culture and we're going to connect it to fertility like we ended with on our lesson 2 video. Alright, so high total fertility rates. Total fertility rates is called TFR a lot in this PowerPoint and in your textbook just so you know what it is. Um, are traditional in many cultures to offset high mortality rates. So if you have high infant mortality rates in your country, normally your culture focuses on having more kids because if you have more kids, then more of them are likely to survive to adulthood. Um, they are traditional in some developing countries as children work contributing to the family's livelihood. So if you live in a very poor country where there's a lot of agriculture, a lot of times having a lot of kids means more kids to help you around your farm. Um, so they tend to like having more kids also for that extra help. So 168 million children between the ages of 5 and 14 worked full-time in 2012, mostly in developing countries. In the United States, of course, most of those kids would be in school. Almost 85 million child laborers do hazardous work, such as mining and construction. So that's where child labor laws come into play, but of course a lot of less developed countries don't have as many child labor laws in place. Or there's nobody really to, you know, kind of make you follow the rules. Some cultures place higher value on male children, and women who bear many sons achieve a higher status, leading to a higher total fertility rate. Um, so again, if you live in a culture where male children are preferred, if you keep having girls over and over, that woman's more likely to try to keep having more babies so that she can eventually get that son, which would be coveted in her culture. So gender inequality exists in most societies. Of course, a lot of less developed countries, it's much more prominent than in the highly developed countries. Women don't have the same rights, opportunities, or privileges as men. Women have lower political, social, and economic status. More women than men live in poverty. In most countries, women are not guaranteed equality in legal rights, education, employment or earnings, or political participation. Sons often go to school, and girls are kept home to work. And in most developing countries, more women are illiterate than men, although progress is being made in this area. So again, a lot of this stuff is happening more in the less developed countries. In America, I don't really know of any families where you know, the son's allowed to go to school and the girl is stuck at home washing dishes and cooking or whatever. Um, so, you know, in America, we've made great leaps to make that equality between the genders. But in a lot of the lower developed countries, this is what happens. Um, so that is a big deal in the total fertility rates, like we'll talk about in the next couple of slides. So the low status of women in many societies is the biggest factor influencing higher total fertility rates. So if women are not considered equal, they tend to have a lot more kids, which puts a stress on the environment. So Marriage age also affects total fertility rate. The earlier a woman marries, the more children she's likely to have. So if a woman does not get to go to school, she's more likely to marry earlier. Because a lot of women, they wait until they're done with school to get married. But if you're not in school, then what's the point of waiting? Um, education also affects the total fertility rates. Less education leads to earlier marriages, like I just said. More education leads to later marriage and fewer children. Education involves women's health awareness understanding of fertility and how to control it, decrease in infant and child mortality. So the more education a woman has, and I'm not even talking about like, oh, you know, I went to college and got a doctorate type of education. We're just talking about basic education of how to take care of a baby so that it's less likely to go through infant mortality, how to recognize signs of dehydration. Um, babies, when they get diarrhea, they get dehydrated very, very quickly, much quicker than like an adult person would. So you know how to take care of things like this. Um, understanding fertility and how to control it, understanding birth control options, things like that. Um, just basic education can help these women in these less developed countries, one, achieve a little bit more equality, but two, kind of decrease those total fertility rates. So health and family planning service availability is necessary if our total fertility rates are going to be reduced across the globe. These services have lower total fertility rates in developing countries if they're available. So that's the problem is we can go educate some women, but there are so many people in the developing countries that it's going to take a long time and a lot of money and resources to educate all of them. <clears throat> um, increased uh, availability of prenatal care has lower total fertility rates, so the better prenatal care they get, the less infant mortality, which lowers the birth rate. 
Um, and information on contraceptive use and access to contraceptives have lower total fertility rate. Um, if you don't have any access to contraceptives, then you can't try to stop from having babies. So if they have access to contraceptives, then they can lower that total fertility rate. So the last topic we're going to talk about in this chapter is urbanization. So urbanization is the movement of people from rural areas to densely populated cities. So moving people from farm town to the big city. <clears throat> Approximately 81% of people in the United States live in cities as of 2015. So in the United States, most people live in cities. Uh, cities have grown due to fewer farms and farmers uh, exist today, resulting in reduced employment opportunities in rural areas. Most of the employment opportunities in rural areas is farming. So if farming decreases because farms are getting more efficient, so we don't need as many of them, um, then people have to go elsewhere for work. Cities are sites of industry, education, cultural, economic, and technological centers. So they have a lot to offer, so people are interested in going into the cities. Cities are urban ecosystems. Certain characteristics are common to cities. City populations have far greater heterogeneity and, uh, than those in rural areas. That means uh, hetero always means different, so different types of people in the population. City residents tend to be younger than those in rural areas. Uh, cities in developing nations tend to have a higher ratio of males to females, but cities in highly developed countries, like ours, they tend to have more females than males. I found that kind of weird, so I left that in the PowerPoint. All right, so our poorer nations have more males living in the city, and our richer nations have more females. And of course, that's because in poorer nations, the females just don't have the same status. So why would they you know, want to go to the city to get work. They can stay at home and have a bunch of babies. That's kind of what the thought process is in those less developed countries. So, you may not live in a big city. You may not live in a rural area. You may live in a subdivision. You probably live in a suburb. The suburban sprawl. So most U.S. urban workers commute to the city from suburbs. So a lot of your parents, they may work up in Atlanta. Uh, and they commute each day, all the way up to Atlanta. But we don't live in Atlanta, we don't live in the big city, we live in the suburbs. Uh, suburbs expand around the city, encroaching onto natural areas and farmland, because development is spread out in the suburbs, having an automobile is necessary to accomplish chores. So since we don't live in a big city with a lot of sidewalks that connect us to every location that we need to go, most of us, we need a car to get around. Like, I need a car to go to Walmart. Um, our heavy dependence on motor vehicles for transportation increases air pollution and other environmental problems. So all of those cars, that becomes an issue. So urban air and water problems. When you have a lot of people in a small area, you're going to have a lot of issues. So high density of commercial enterprises in urban areas cause buildup of airborne emissions. So you have a lot of industry happening in a small area in a city, and so you have a lot of air pollution from that. Urban areas in developing nations have the worst air pollution in the world because in highly developed nations like ours, we try to control a lot of that pollution. We have a lot of rules in place from the government, but in developing countries, they don't. They're just lucky they have the industry that's making them money. And so air pollution is the far from their minds. Um, so they have the worst air pollution in the world. Cities affect water flow because rainfall absorbing soil is covered with pavement and buildings. When you have like a forest, when it rains, that rain can be absorbed into the ground. That rain can be absorbed into the plants and the trees. When you have a city, it all runs down the drain. And it's just running across the road, picking up pollutants, things like that. You can have more flooding because there's nothing really absorbing the water. It all has to run off somewhere. Um, urban runoff can contain multiple pollutants and sometimes remains untreated, potentially contaminating waterways distant from the cities. So all that runoff that goes down into the sewers, that's eventually going to go into a river, a stream, the ocean, wherever, and all those pollutants are going to go with it. So, um, what can we do about all this? Because cities aren't just going to go away, so what can we do to make them better for the environment? Well, urban planning of uh, a city in Brazil, I'll say that because I'm not really sure how to say it, Curitiba, I don't know. Um, that's an example of a compact development. It's actually home to 3.0 million people. That's a lot of people in a city. 
They have an efficient mass transit system and traffic management. Two million people use the mass transportation system daily. So when you have a huge city with a lot of people, if everybody has their own car, that is a lot of emissions. So if you can have a bus system, a train system that's accessible to a lot of people, that can help cut down on those emissions. Instead of vehicular travel, the center is a big sidewalk that consists of 49 blocks of pedestrian walkways connected to bus stations, parks, and bicycle paths. So see, they're giving them options. Instead of just driving your car to work, you could walk, you could take the bus, or you could bike because they have a system of sidewalks so you can get anywhere in the city safely. Nobody wants to walk or bike on a busy road, so if you have sidewalks available, more people are likely to do those things. It was the first city in Brazil to use low polluting fuel that burns cleanly, so that helps cut down on emissions too. Labor intensive garbage purchase program. The poor people can actually exchange garbage for bus tokens, food, and school notebooks. So one, that's helping clean the environment because people are picking up the trash, but two, that gives the poor people a way to get goods that they need. They can pick up trash, which does a service to the environment, but in that, when they turn the trash in, they can get money that they need that they can't get from other jobs. So it's possible to have less polluting cities. It just takes a lot of time and effort and proper planning. Alright, so that was chapter 7, our population control chapter.